Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our remote worship service. We are so glad that you have joined us on this very special Lord's Day. Uh, this probably feels a bit strange for many of you remaining there in your homes on what is one of the uh, Sundays that attracts the most people to the house of God because of that great historic event that is so central to our lives as Christians, and that, of course, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, that is why we continue to worship. That's why we continue to sing praises to our God is because we do not have a dead God, but we serve the living and the true God. So as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ today, uh, let me extend my warm welcome to you and encourage you to turn your thoughts heavenward, to turn your thoughts to the one who is above, who is alive, who is well, and also to turn our attention back to that most important event in all of human history, and that is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is more significant than any pandemic, than any virus, than any event in the world. And so let's celebrate together the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 19 says this, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. Let's do that together now by singing, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Now let's bow our heads and pray to our risen Savior. O Lord, our soul longs, yes, it faints for the courts of the Lord. Our heart and our flesh, they sing for joy to the living God. With Peter, we gladly confess, Lord Jesus, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the true and living God. You are the resurrection and the life. While always the living God, yet you became man. And you died for sinners. But you were not abandoned to Hades. Nor did your flesh see corruption. But you were raised up. Oh, blessed be you, our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to your great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We were dead in our sin. We were not your people. But now it is said, even of us, children of the living God, we who dwelled in the dust, you have awakened by your Son and by your Holy Spirit. And now, we sing for joy, for the earth will give birth to the dead. And so now we ask that you would meet with us, O living God, and grant to us your joy in your Son, who is the resurrection and the life. All this we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Christians throughout the ages have been confessing the creed known as the Apostles' Creed, and I invite you to confess it with me together this morning. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue worshiping now with Psalm 103. O oh, bless the Lord.
Old Testament reading this morning, we turn our attention to the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37. This is a wonderful text about the new life that comes through our God and through his word. Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Let's bow our hearts together as we pray and confess our sins to the living God. The Lord, you are the God of life, but we were all dead. Spiritually, we were like the dry, dead bones that Ezekiel saw in the valley. We were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, we were following the course of this world. We were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We were carrying out the desires of our own body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Yes, once we were dead, but... Now in Christ we are alive because you are not only the God of life, you are also the God of love and of mercy. You are rich in mercy because of the great love with which you loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, you made us alive together with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by grace that we have been saved. And you have raised us up with him, and you've seated us with him in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. And yet even now, as those who are alive and are well in Christ, as those who are seated in heavenly places, still we often live as if sin and death rule over us. Even though you tell us, to not let sin reign in our mortal body, to make us obey its passions, and, and not to present our members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. 
but instead that we are to present ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death unto life. And so we ask our God for your mercy, and we pray that you would forgive us for living as if Christ is not raised, and as if we are not raised with him. Forgive us, we pray, for our weak, uninformed faith that often looks more like doubt than it does like belief. Enable us, we pray, to live knowing full well that our old self was indeed crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Believing that if, if we've died with Christ, surely then we will also live with Christ. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him because the death he died he died for sin, and that once for all, the life he lives. He lives to you, our God. And so we also must consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Hear our humble cry and grant that we might know Christ better and the power of his glorious resurrection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you now hear these good words from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. This is good news from the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It is worth singing about. Let's open our hymnals and join it together in singing number 266, Thou Art the Way. This morning, we turn our attention to the Gospel of John in chapter 11. Uh, on this Lord's Day, uh, we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate that every Lord's Day, but we do take a few moments to remember uh, the significance of this vital truth to the Christian life this morning. And so I want to invite you to look with me in your copy of God's Word there in your homes uh, to John chapter 11. 
Now, the beginning of John's gospel, before I read this, I want to say, contains a number of different signs that the Lord Jesus performed, uh, seven of them to be exact. And what we come to this morning here in John chapter 11 is Jesus' seventh climactic sign leading up to his own resurrection from the dead. With that said, let's give our attention to God's word. Uh, This is a rather lengthy account, so let me encourage you to continue to pay careful attention to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. John chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us now go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, And the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. 
Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. This is God's infallible word, his word of comfort for us today. Let's pray that God would use it for our benefit. Our gracious Father in heaven, as we open again your word, the word of God, which is living and is active, that word which is sharper than any two-edged sword, that word which pierces to the division of our souls and of our spirit of joints and marrow, which even discerns the very thoughts and intentions of our heart. We ask now not for the spirit of the world, but we ask for the spirit which is from you, our God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by you. We ask that as we remember your statutes, we might also remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in the gospel. Even that gospel promised beforehand through the prophets and the holy scriptures. Yes, that gospel concerning your son, who was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Oh, Father, I ask that you would grant me that like the apostles of old, that I would give clear testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and that great grace would be upon all of us. Well, this we humbly ask in the name of of the Lord Jesus, the author of life, our Savior. Amen. Let me ask you a question this morning. Why does God permit, better yet, why does God plan sorrows in our lives? That is a question that many are asking in times like these. There are many throughout the world, there are many within the church who are asking this question. And there are many experiences in our lives that lead us to ask questions like this. There, there are chronic illnesses that we deal with. Uh, there are terminal illnesses which uh, people encounter. Uh, sometimes, uh, of course, that leads to uh, the unhappy and untimely parting of family members from us, and there's the loss of life and all of these sorrows. Now, the passage we've just read is perhaps one of the most emotional and heart-rending passages in all of the Bible. If you've ever endured the sickness of a loved one who then has eventually passed away, you can appreciate why this scene is so deeply emotional. There is a family member who is sick, a brother who is ill. Uh, there's the attempt to obtain treatment to find a cure for him. Uh, there's the unsuccessful attempt, and he dies. Then there's a funeral scene with family and friends all gathered together, grieving over the loss of this man, all knowing that something could have been done in order to save him. There was a physician, you see, that they knew and that they'd heard about who could have cured the man. They knew that the situation could have turned out so differently. Lazarus of Bethany, of course, was the man who was sick described as weak in verse 1. And apparently his two sisters, Mary and Martha, had been caring for him. Now this is the same Mary, John points out, that would later anoint the feet of Jesus with costly ointment. 
Just imagine if you were one of these two sisters and your brother was gravely ill and you knew this one, you knew Jesus, you knew this great physician who had been healing all sorts of people. And John's gospel is re recording a number of different uh, circumstances where Jesus has healed people. In John chapter four, you may recall that Jesus healed the official son and he did it from a distance. He didn't even come uh, in person to do it. In John chapter five, we read about the lame man by the pool of Bethesda. Again, Jesus heals the man. Or closer to our account in John chapter nine, uh, Jesus had healed a man who was blind and he had been blind from his birth. Now, what would you do if you were Mary or you were Martha? Well, you'd probably do just what they do. You'd send for Jesus to, to come and help, as in verse 3. You've healed all these other people. Now, won't you come to us? Won't you help Lazarus, our brother, the one that, that you love? If you come, you can help him. Now, we're told that Jesus loved Lazarus as well as his sisters in verse 5. And so when we come to verse 6, it probably comes as a bit of a surprise to us when we read. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Why wouldn't Jesus come immediately to help Lazarus? How could a delay possibly be an evidence of his love for this family? That surely would have been a question in the disciples' minds, which is no doubt why Jesus says in verse 4 that Lazarus' illness wouldn't ultimately be fatal. And yet, after two days pass by, Jesus says to the disciples in verse 7, let's go to Judea again. Now, at this point, the disciples are not eager to do that. Uh, after all, the Jews back in Judea, uh, they had just tried to stone Jesus. If you look back in chapter 10 and verse 31, or if you look in verse 8 of our text, uh, they had just tried to kill Jesus. So you can imagine what the disciples are thinking. If Lazarus is going to get better anyway, why do we need to go back there? Why put our lives, why put your life at risk? When Jesus responds to them in verse 9, he uses an analogy that they would have been familiar with. It's an analogy from their typical work day. He reminds them uh, that it is still daylight while he is with them. He's the light of the world. And that's when you do work. It's still time, in other words, to be doing the works of his father, even if it means going into an area where uh, it would have been dangerous. So let's go, because I need to wake Lazarus up, he says, verse 11. Now, at this point, the disciples are still trying to dissuade Jesus. Verse 12, Lord, if he's just sleeping, he'll recover. He'll be just fine. And that's when we're told in, in verse 13 that clearly they are misunderstanding Jesus. And so Jesus has to put it very plainly to them in verse 14. Lazarus has died. Now, at this point in the story, Jesus makes another very surprising statement. You see it there in verse 15, when he says to them, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. What would prompt Jesus to say something like that? You see, part of what he's saying is that all of this is a demonstration not only of his love for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but it's a demonstration of his love and his care for the disciples. It's, it's for their sake. How could that possibly be true? What possible benefit could there be in waiting to arrive until Lazarus has succumbed to the illness? Waiting till he's been in the grave for four days, as verse 17 tells us. It doesn't seem like a demonstration of his love. Now, Martha certainly doesn't see it that way, does she? When she hears that Jesus is coming, she goes out to meet him. And notice what she says in verses 21 and 22. She says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. 
She is saying, in other words, I still believe that God hears your prayers and he does what you ask, but if only you had come earlier, my brother would still be alive. You can almost hear the implied question in what she says. Why did you wait to come? Now, even when Jesus assures her that Lazarus will rise again in verse 23, she still doesn't seem to believe that Jesus could do that at present. She thinks Jesus is just talking about the future day of the resurrection. Verse 24, she says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Even though she says that she believes what Jesus has told her, that he is the resurrection and the life, it's clear that she hasn't yet believed that that is so. But she does believe that he is the Messiah and she's glad that he's come, albeit too late. And so she goes to fetch her sister Mary, whom Christ has asked to see. Now Mary is still at home uh, with many of the Jews who had come to console her and offer their condolences. And so as not to cause a big stir, Martha apparently whispers in the ear of her sister that the teacher wants to see you. Come with me. And so Mary quickly departs, but all of the Jews who are there thought she must be going to the tomb of Lazarus to weep there and they don't want her to have to be alone, and, and so they follow after her. So there's this entire funeral procession now that's uh, going to Jesus. And when they arrive there, Mary falls down at Jesus' feet, weeping, verse 32. Tears streaming down her cheeks. And she exclaims basically the same thing that her sister said, though certainly with more emotion. Verse 32, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only you had been here, everything would be okay. If only you had come earlier, I wouldn't be dealing with this overwhelming grief that now has gripped me. Jesus, why? Why didn't you come earlier before he died? Why did you wait? You could have done something if you had only come sooner. Now you'll notice that Mary is not the only one who has this perspective. Mary's also not the only one weeping. The Jews who come out were told that they were also weeping in verse 33. And in this section, we have uh, a description of perhaps one of the most tender moments of Jesus' humanity. He's deeply moved. The misery and the grief of sin which has surrounded them, which is like this dark cloud casting its shadow upon them, it moves him. And in the shortest verse of all the Bible, verse 35, we're confronted with one of the fullest expressions of Christ's true humanity. Jesus wept. Brothers and sisters, there is a lesson here for us. It is okay to cry. Sin and its misery is a terrible thing. And we should weep over it. Blessed are those who mourn. Now, as Christians, we shouldn't weep as those who don't have hope. First Thessalonians 4.13 tells us that. But it is okay to grieve. Now, brothers, this is perhaps especially important for us to remember. It's not a wimpy or unmanly thing in order to cry. The son of man, the last Adam, the man of all men was troubled and he wept so much so that the Jews had to admit in verse 36 that even though Jesus didn't arrive soon enough, that in fact he did love Lazarus. But I want you to notice how the Jews also express basically the same sentiment that both Mary and Martha had expressed to Jesus. Verse 37, some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? They believed that this miracle worker who had opened the eyes of the man who was born blind, that this one could have kept Lazarus from dying if he had just come earlier. And the implication being that if only he had not delayed, all of this could have had a much happier ending. 
And so do you see what all of them have in common, and yet what none of them yet believe? They all have in common the belief that Jesus could have kept this sick man from dying. Martha said it in verse 21. Mary said it in verse 32. And here we have the Jews saying it in verse 37. They all believe that he's a great physician. Now that might sound very complimentary. It might show promising signs of their faith but it also betrays a profound misunderstanding of who Jesus is. Because while all of them have this belief in common, none of them, so it seems, believe yet that Jesus could actually raise Lazarus from the dead now that he is in the tomb. If only you had come sooner, you could have kept him alive. You see, they did not believe that Jesus himself was the resurrection, and the life. Resuscitation from near or apparent death? Yes. The great physician who can heal the sick? Yes. But the resurrection and the life? Not yet. They did not come to see and believe that about Jesus yet. Even as much as Martha's confession in verse 27 seems to outshine her sister and the rest of the Jews who were there, the crowd, her response to Jesus in verse 39, it betrays that she still lacks faith in Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Because when Jesus says that they're to take away the stone, Martha interjects and she says, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He has been dead four days. In other words, he's, he's starting to decompose. Or as the King James puts it, he stinketh. See, underneath her confession, there was remaining confusion and doubts about Jesus and his identity. It was a wonderful encouragement to us in our Christian walk as well, something wonderful that we learn about the patience of our Savior who continues to disciple us. He doesn't save us because of the strength or because of the purity of our faith. No, he saves us because of the object of our faith. He is the one who saves us, and he is so patient with us with all of our confusions, with our doubts, with our misconceptions and misunderstandings, patiently disciples us along the way. And accompanying their misunderstanding about Jesus, you'll notice, was not just a misunderstanding about him, but a profound misunderstanding about themselves. Because they saw Jesus just as a healer of the sick and not as the resurrection and the life, they also failed to see themselves as who they really were, as truly dead in their trespasses and sins. Their view of themselves was more as spiritually sick, with some sort of remaining ability to assist Jesus in new life. If we were to use the theological term which sums up this belief, it's called semi-Pelagianism. This notion that there's still this residual ability in myself to help Jesus with the new life that he gives. But Jesus doesn't just keep people from dying. He brings the dead back to life. I wonder, who do you see yourself in? Who do you identify with in this text? Some of you might identify with Mary or with Martha, and the sorrows of this life, maybe the loss of some loved one has overwhelmed you, and perhaps you even identify with their uh, need to grow in their understanding of Jesus. I hope we'd all say that. Maybe you identify with the crowd, those who have come to console Mary and Martha, also in need to better understand the identity and the work of Jesus Christ. But I wonder if you see yourself at all in Lazarus. Not Lazarus before he died, but do you see yourself in Lazarus after he died? Because you see, spiritually speaking, we are no different. We are not just sick, 
lying on our deathbed. No, we are already spiritually dead. We are in the tomb. We are lifeless. We are rotting corpses, as it were. This, you see, is what Jesus wants us to believe. This is what brings him glory. Not grasping on to some sort of residual ability in myself to follow Jesus, but believing that I am a dead man a dead woman or boy and girl, that I'm in the tomb already. I'm 100% unable to follow him until he speaks and gives me new life. God is rich in mercy, Paul said to the Ephesians, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, not sick, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And so it is by grace, you see, that we are saved through faith. Did you notice how Jesus brings Lazarus back to life? He simply speaks. He is the Word who is in the beginning with God, the one through whom all things were made, who spoke all things into existence in creation. And he is the one who speaks and he brings about new creation, new life. He cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, the man who had died, his hands and his feet still bound with linen strips and his face still wrapped with a cloth, he comes walking out at the life-giving voice of Jesus Christ. It is, you see, by the word of God that the dead are raised to life. So here is the hard but true love of Jesus. Yes, he delayed his arrival. Yes, he delayed it even to the point where Lazarus gets sicker and sicker, even to the point of succumbing and dying. But you see, Jesus, like the good shepherd, he is leading them through the valley of the shadow of death, not doing this despite his love for them, but he allows them to go through the valley because of his love for them, verses 5 and 6. It's in order that they might know their true spiritual condition and that they might also know who Jesus Christ really and truly is. You see, even when Jesus lifts up his eyes to the Father and he prays to the Father, it was for them in order that they might believe. You see, there is another death and resurrection for God's glory and for the faith of his followers, and that is Jesus' death and resurrection. Yes, this passage is in some ways focused on Lazarus. He's the one who's died. He's the one who's brought back to life. But the primary actor, the one to whom our attention ought to be drawn, is Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Jesus, who would actually go on to the cross. The author of life would give his life. The one who is the resurrection and the life, he would enter into the tomb himself, not for sins of his own, but for the sins of his people. But he would not need to hear some other voice in order that he might come out of the tomb. No, he has resurrection life within himself. And so by his own power, he's declared to be the son of God because of his resurrection from the dead. And so, let us return for a moment to that question that we began with. Why does God allow sorrows in our lives? Why does he allow even Christians to still physically die? Or to experience other griefs in this world? It is because in the end, it brings glory to God and it is out of his love for his people. You see, our sorrows are not the absence of Jesus' love. For the Christian, they actually become part of the demonstration of Jesus' love because it is through them 
that we better understand the miseries and the horrors of sin and its effect upon us. But it is also through them that we can come to better understand the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ, to better understand who he is as the one who delivers us from all of them as the resurrection and the life. You know, at this point in your lives, many of us, we have lots of time in our homes, perhaps more time than we know what to do with. And as we are hearing the news and we're hearing of all of the grief and the sorrow, even as that may have come and, and touched some of your own families, even if it's not with this virus, if there is grief in your life in some other way, you see the Lord can use that for good. He can use that to teach you how terrible sin is, all the misery that it brings, how we should weep over it, but also so that you might better know the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the answer to it all, who gives life beyond this life, who raises the dead and gives eternal life to his people. If you will but come to understand and believe your true spiritual condition, that you are spiritually dead and that you need life in a Savior, Jesus promises that he will give it to you because he is the resurrection and the life. Let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. We are often foolish. We are slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken of you. We are slow of heart to believe what you have spoken of yourself. And so we pray and ask you, Lord, to enable us by your Holy Spirit that we might know you, O Christ, that we might know the power of your resurrection. We might even share in your sufferings and so become like you in your death, that by any means possible, we may attain the resurrection from the dead. Lord, it is true. We often fret and complain. We often doubt when we are suffering. We complain about the hardship. We doubt who you are and what you've promised. Lord, we do believe, and yet we pray that you would help our unbelief. We ask this morning for those who are suffering in various ways and at various places throughout this world. And we pray this morning for those who are suffering among our own congregation, for those who are suffering physically. We pray this morning for Missy Weibel as she remains in the hospital, that you would care for her. We pray for others who are shut-ins or who are sick, that you would give them comfort in the Lord Jesus. We also pray for those who are suffering emotionally, experiencing the loss of life. We pray for the Curti family. We pray for others who have uh, lost loved ones and are still grieving over their loss. We pray, too, for those who might be suffering financially, whether they've lost their employment or maybe they've experienced theft or some other loss, we pray that you would reveal yourself to them in this hour of trial. Our God in heaven, we also pray for those who are suffering throughout this world, those who are experiencing the grief of losing those that they love by either this virus or by some other means. We pray that you would use their grief, their sorrows, to teach them of Jesus Christ, to prove to him that he is the resurrection and the life, that he is the answer to all of their sorrows and all of their sadness. We pray for those in this world who are suffering loss in various other ways, that you might be pleased to work all things together for good, to show them yourself, and to bring the gospel home to them. Oh Lord, how we thank and praise you, the living God, the God of resurrection life, that you do indeed give life to the dead, even life eternal in your risen Son. And so it is in his name that we pray all of these things with thanksgiving. Amen. 
At this time, ordinarily in our service, we would uh, collect our offerings. Uh, if you want to send your checks to the church address, you may do that. Or if you would prefer to set those aside and uh, to give those when Lord willing, we'll be able to resume our uh, fellowship together in person. That would be fine as well. At this time, let's join our voices together singing Worship Christ, the Risen King. It is the God of life who is the resurrection and the life who gives you his blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.